theory, then do finish up the math stuff, and then go back into theory. So there's sort of the, the math is the in-between part <laughs> to get through, because we still need to talk. We did start parts per million, parts per billion, but I don't think we finished it. We still have dilutions to do in Chapter 8. So this is material that was really like right after talking about types of solutions. So when you make a solution, remember you have a solute dissolved in water is the typical liquid solution we've been talking about. But the kind of solute can have a characteristic of being called an electrolyte. So the term electrolyte came about because they found that if some solutes were put in water, it was capable of conducting an electric current. Other solutes are not. So the term electrolyte came about, and ionic compounds particularly tend to be electrolytes because when they dissolve in water, like if you just take sodium chloride, NaCl, which you know is a solid, so you know that little S after NaCl just tells you it's a solid. If you hydrate it, which means that you just put it in water and let it dissolve, in the hydration reaction, the sodium and the chloride ions separate so that crystal gets broken down remember those ion dipole interactions so the sodium's attracted to the oxygen of the water the chlorine's attracted to the hydrogens of the water and that allows this big crystal to basically get broken down separated and it dissolves completely so what you end up with are sodium ions which are aqueous remember that aq just means they're dissolved and chloride ions which are also aqueous. If it's a strong electrolyte like sodium chloride is, then 100% of the sodium chloride ions form, or sorry, sodium chloride solid forms these ions. And it's kind of like the very first image in this picture where this one, their example is magnesium chloride. Taking magnesium chloride, do you see like all of the little little dots inside, they're all ions. So you have like three Mg plus two white little dots. You have six Cl minus green dots, but all of them form ions. That is a strong electrolyte. So one of the characteristics of a strong electrolyte is because it makes many ions, it can carry an electric current strongly. So this little setup is an electrode set up with a light bulb. So this little white thing right here that's like shining, that's a little light bulb. The There's an electrical supply, and then you see those two little electrodes, those two little like sticks hanging down in the liquid. So if there's ions, then the electric current can go from through the liquid from one electrode to the next, passes across, and that completes the electric current, and then the light bulb will light. So I have one. It's, it's not OSHA. It's not very OSHA compliant. But here's my like pulp apparatus. Okay. So I actually stole it from Wilson. <laughs> so I worked at Wilson Tech. It was Wilson Tech, now it's Wilson Community College. When I worked there from 95 to 2003, just showing you how old I am. When I was working there, we had a whole bunch of these. And I was like, well, these are neat. So I was like, I'm taking one. When I left, nobody ever did. Never, no one's ever contacted me, right? So first off, this is just distilled water, okay? So distilled water, believe it or not, water does make ions, but it's a very, very, very low concentration. So distilled water does not make enough ions to carry an electric current, so you see that the light bulb doesn't light up. But if I take salt, so this is salt water, I actually put a little... So, see that sodium chloride? Agree? Okay? I promise I didn't put anything else in. This just came, I was just grabbing stuff out of, just grabbing stuff out of the chemical storeroom. I was like, yeah, that'll work. Right? So, the goal is, remember, when you do a hydration, you want that salt to dissolve. So, just trying to mix it up, get the salt to dissolve pretty quickly. So now I have more and more and more sodium ions and chloride ions floating around in that solution. This is sort of like not as bad as the antacid lab yesterday. Everybody was like, why are we stirring this so far? Okay, about right. Pretty close. 
some things floating around until those heart dissolve. Okay, so I have lots of ions in this solution. So now, okay, so it is capable, those ions, this is a strong electrolyte because it has so many ions, it can carry the electric current from one pole to the other. And again, I'll go back and rinse with water. Those of the water still. Not enough ions, even though I'm just rinsing the electrodes. Not enough ions that are there. So then the second one is what they call a non-electrolyte. So sugar. Sugar is a covalent molecule. So it does dissolve in water. Right? <coughs> you put sugar in your coffee, stir it up, completely dissolves. It's polar, which is why it mixes with water. But when it dissolves, it doesn't make ions. Those sugar molecules just do their hydrogen bonding and dipole-dipole interaction. So here's the sugar water. And here's some sugar. So I got dextrose and glucose. this, I'm going to get some to dissolve, because this one, even though it's dissolving, I don't have any ions being formed, I just have more sugar, more sugar, more sugar dissolving in the water. And so those sugar molecules don't have a charge, they're not ionic, very good. And so this one, notice that it does it. Okay, so not all solutes form ions. The ionic compounds are capable of forming those ions. If they just dissociate or form 100% of ions, they can carry that electric current. But covalent molecules typically don't. So I'll do one more rinse. So then I thought it would be an interesting thing to use saturated sodium chloride. So so you remember in class, in lab, when we had to, when we make soap, at the very end of the soap making stage, you had to put that cold sodium chloride into your soap and stir it up before we filtered it. So whether you were there or not, but can you see that there's like salt down in the bottom? So this is a saturated, remember we talked about like gout and kidney stones. This is an example of a saturated solution. And you see the salt down in the bottom. So there's, as much salt dissolved in this solution as can possibly be dissolved. So there's still salt down in the bottom. So those crystals cannot dissolve in the water because it's already got as much salt in it as possible. So you can kind of see as I roll it around, you can kind of see the salt. I'm just trying to think like if you're not in labs, you've probably not seen it. But can you see that's those solid crystals down in the bottom? So this is a good example of a saturated solution. So saturated solutions have as much solute dissolved as possible. So I can, can you see the salt that's in there? So no matter what I do, I can't get any more salt to dissolve because it's holding as much as it possibly can. Can you see it? Like that salt that's in the bottom. All right, so I've got some. I took this one and I was like, so this is a lot of ions. So I was like, I wonder if the, electric, if the light bulb will blow up. And so I tried it last night, it didn't blow up. But it's still kind of cool. So where, here's my saturated. So this is the liquid that came out of here. And so I was like, let's just try this one. So this one, if you listen, I didn't hear the pop. Yes, so last night when I like did this at first, it went like, and I was like, <laughs> But see how very bright it is, okay? A saturated sodium chloride solution, this has the maximum amount of ions possible, carries this electric current Totally able to like really, really like that light bulb. Strong electrolyte. Lots of ions. Now, my distilled water now has enough ions in it. Do you see what it's starting to do? I'm just trying to rinse it. I knew that that would eventually happen, that I would end up with enough solute in the rinsing that my distilled water would start glowing. Okay? But what about the third one? So this third one, they call it a weak electrolyte. So there are some compounds that can form ions, but they don't form very many. So most of the time they remain as a solid whole molecule and only a few of the molecules will actually form ions. Vinegar is an example of this, okay? So if you like, that's what happens when you sit in the front and smell it. What does it smell like? Vinegar. <laughs> so it definitely is, it's vinegar. Okay, it's like a 4% acetic acid solution. 
it was just vinegar. I put it back in his bottle last night because I didn't want to sink all of them up. Okay? But look at this. So notice the difference in the brightness of the light bulb. So the light bulb is like this like dim kind of look to it. It doesn't get super bright. This is because there are some <coughs> ions, but not very many. So it can carry an electric current, but it doesn't carry them very well. Okay? So you get this really dim light bulb in comparison to those sodium chloride ones. So that's what they call a weak electrolyte. So then there was just a couple of other ones that I was like, let's just try some other ones. So I also brought ethanol. So ethanol is CH3C, CH2OH, right? It's just carbon with an alcohol group on the end. So it's a covalent molecule. What do you think? Do you think it's an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte? The non electrolyte because there's nothing but a covalent molecule. So if it doesn't have, so if it doesn't have the ability to form ions, if it's a covalent molecule, like the sugar molecule, ethanol, these molecules aren't going to be able to carry that current because there's no ions that are present. You need to have something that's a salt, like sodium chloride, magnesium chloride, or an acid or a base. Vinegar is acetic acid. And so acids like to create hydrogen ions. So those hydrogen ions are capable of carrying electric current. And so let's look at sort of the reactions. I survived it. <laughs> Didn't electrocute myself in my entire career. <laughs> <laughs> Solid right there. <laughs> All right. So strong electrolytes. So in a strong electrolyte, this is where you have an ionic compound when you hydrate it. A hydration reaction just means that you dissolve it in water, right? So if you hydrate it, it breaks into its individual ions. Notice the arrow goes in one direction, not in both directions. So I know that that means that 100% forms these ions. Sodium chloride, you would do the same thing, right? If I had NaCl... Hydrating it, 100% Na and Cl. HCl, hydrochloric acid, that was one that we used in lab yesterday. It was our stomach acid sample. Hydrochloric acid starts off as a liquid. If I hydrate it, one of the things that, that acids do is they will break into ions and release or produce hydrogen ions. <coughs> So HCl is another one that would produce lots of ions, strong electrolyte. Light bulb would be super bright. Non-electrolytes, they also have the arrow going in the same direction. But what do the products look like? The structure or the formula of the product is actually the same <laughs> as... When you look at the product side, it looks just like the reactant. Right? You notice it looks exactly the same on both sides. So if you take sugar, dissolve it in water, you don't change the structure or how those atoms are put together. They stay together in exactly the same way. Non-electrolytes are super, super easy to recognize because you can see that they go from being a solid or a liquid to being aqueous without changing the formula. Formula is exactly the same. Arrow goes in one direction. You just go from being a solid to being aqueous. <coughs> Covalent molecules, they don't separate into ions. But the third one, so the third one we did was like the vinegar, okay? The weak electrolyte. <coughs> so weak electrolytes, they do form ions, but not very much. So that means that this molecule, the, the CH3COOH, the one that's the reactant, when it hydrates, only about 5% of the molecules form ions. That is why the light bulb didn't have very many ions to carry the current. That's why the light bulb was pretty dim. That means that 95% of this molecule doesn't separate. So in the beaker, I don't have just ions. I don't have just whole molecules. I actually have all of them. And that's why they use the arrow going back and forth. Remember, that's like reversible. 
So some of the vinegar molecules will form ions. Some of the ions will reform vinegar molecules. So you end up with this like back and forth movement. Notice that a weak electrolyte, the arrow goes in both directions. You do have some ions formed. So in that way, it kind of looks like the strong electrolyte, but that's the way to tell the difference between them. Weak electrolytes will have a double arrow. Strong electrolytes are going to have a single arrow. So you need to be able to identify strong versus weak versus a non-electrolyte. Like if you look at a reaction, but I'm not going to ask you to complete a reaction or anything like that. But just looking at those, you can kind of pick out the differences between a strong electrolyte, arrow in one direction, ions produced. A non-electrolyte, arrow in one direction, no ions in the product. The ions are just dissolved. And then a weak electrolyte is one where you have arrows in both directions with ions produced. Okay? So that was sort of like the, the discussion about like what um, an electrolyte is when talking about ionic solutions. Electrolytes exist in the body as their single ions. So you know that like when you eat salty food, you eat salt, that sodium chloride, but as soon as that dissolves in your saliva, now you have sodium ions and chloride ions. They don't stay connected. They're strong electrolytes, so they separate into their separate ions. One of the terms that they use when talking about concentration of electrolytes is they use the term equivalence. So when you see this, just don't let that throw you. Don't be like, I don't know what that thing, I don't know what that term means. An equivalent is really very similar to talking about numbers of molecules or moles. So remember moles is the number of molecules, but really based on their mass or size. Well, in this, an equivalent is the number of moles, but relative to the charge. So if you have a sodium ion, because it has just a plus one, every mole of sodium ions has one equivalent. They're the same because the charge is the same as the number of moles. But look at the difference with calcium. So calcium has a plus two charge. Because it has every atom of calcium carries a plus two charge, every mole of calcium was said to be having two equivalents. Okay, so the term equivalent is really just the amount of your ion or the electrolyte relative to its charge. So you see how those two are different. So when you look at blood, if you get blood work back, if they look at sodium levels, it's going to be listed typically in what they call milli equivalents. So when you see an equivalent, just know that it's really talking about concentration. It's referring to concentration, but you use the word equivalent with electrolytes because it's talking about the charge as well as the number, the amount. Okay, so then we started going back, so now back into the math. <laughs> so we were going through some of the math parts and concentration. So the big thing I told you is to remember any kind of concentration, whether it's molarity, whether it's percent solutions, whether it's parts per million, parts per billion, any concentration is always the amount of the solute compared to some amount of the solution. Sometimes it's 100 mils of solution, sometimes it's liters of solution. So it just depends on which type of concentration so just remember though, it's how much of the solute compared to the total solution content. And the solution is the solvent and the solute together. So when you talk about amount of solution, it's not just the solvent. It's not just the water, it includes the solute content. So then we were going through molarity. So we did some concentration, we did some calculations. So you can pick one of these up on your way out. If you didn't pick one up already, so on the front, I kind of have like sort of summary stuff about concentration, parts per million, percent solutions, and dilution. But then on the back, there's some practice problems. The key for this is posted in Moodle, okay? So if you're like, okay, I think practicing these, I think I've got this. If you get stuck, there's some, the like I said, the answers and sort of like I worked all of them out so you can see the steps along with it. Those are posted in Moodle that you can use. And if you didn't grab one on the way in, grab one on the way out. 
So we went through these, went through these, went through these. Then we got to percent solutions. So percent solutions is really how much you have relative to 100. Because remember, everything on percent is always on a scale of 0 to 100. So when you're talking about, and we're really going to concentrate on what they call the mass to volume percent. Mass to volume percent is what you use in a liquid solution because it's how much of your solute, salt, any kind of electrolyte, any kind of covalent molecule dissolved per 100 mils of solution. There are others. There is mass to mass, which would be if you were weighing samples out. There is volume to volume if you were working with liquid solutions. So if you were working with two completely liquid solutions, one liquid was a solute, one liquid was a solvent, then you would have volume to volume. But really, if you're like most comfortable with the mass, just kind of concentrate on the mass to volume because that's what most of our solutions are. That's what mo most of your solutions that you work with in healthcare are going to be in that form. So we talked about doing some of the, the making up solutions, figuring out what percent solution, given those, that information. And then we got down to the parts per million and parts per billion part. So remember I said in parts per million or parts per billion, the key thing is to first do this, okay? You're going to put your, your solute. It's always going to tell you what a solute amount you have. Put that in grams. So you may have to do a unit conversion. Most of the time, it's well, always for this, it'll only be a single unit conversion, like one step. So you have to go from milligrams to grams or from decigrams to grams or from kilograms to grams. You're just going to have to convert your solute mass to grams, convert the solution volume to milliliters. So if you're given liters, you got to convert it to milliliters. Then you're going to just divide those. So it's grams divided by milliliters. Then all you do is multiply your number times a million if you're looking at parts per million or multiply it times a billion if you're looking if you're trying to figure out parts per billion. Big kicker with this is just make sure that you really are careful about counting your zeros because that's where most people end up making mistakes is that they don't put they either put too many zeros or not enough zeros in their calculator so just kind of count the zeros as you add them in. So parts per million and parts per billion are talking about really small amounts. So this, copper in drinking water is toxic above levels of 1.3 parts per million. So at the water treatment plant, one thing that they do every week is you pull a water sample and you send that water sample off and they measure things like heavy metals. So they measure things like, they try to measure copper content, mercury, is there any mercury in this water? Try to measure lead levels, is there any lead in this water? Is there any other heavy metals that could potentially cause disease or have a negative health effect on anybody that drinks this water? So Copper would be one that would actually get into pipes, especially pipes that are really old. So as pipes get old, they begin to erode and corrode. So you can end up having copper in the water, drinking water. So above 1.3 parts per million is considered toxic. So if you test 500 milliliter sample of water and they measure 150 micrograms of copper, is this safe to drink? So I know my solute my solute amount, I know my volume. So I can figure out parts per million just knowing those two numbers. What is the units that I got to put them in? Grams divided by milliliters, okay? So I'm going to have to put the solute mass into grams. So my solute amount is 150 micrograms of copper. So that's not grams, so I know that I have to do a unit conversion and put it into grams. So 150 micrograms times in the line. What goes on the bottom? Micrograms, right? The unit you start with always goes on the bottom. What goes on top? Grams, the unit that I want. Micro, when you see milli, milli gets a thousand, micro gets a million. Mm -hmm. So I have to put a million, one, two, three, four, five, six, a million micrograms makes one gram, the base unit. 
So this is going to allow micrograms and micrograms to cancel. So doing the math, 150 divided by a million. Is 0 0.00015 grams. Decimal place goes to the left by the number of zeros. Okay, so now I have my solute in grams. That's the first step. Second step is I need to put my volume in milliliters. So is my volume in milliliters? Yeah, it's already there. So volume, 500 milliliters. Check. Okay, if it was in liters or deciliters or centiliters, any other volume, it's got to be in milliliters. So now I have my two numbers. So I'm going to take 0 0.00015 grams divided by 500 milliliters, and then I have to multiply this answer times what? Times a million, because I want parts per million. If it was parts per billion, I'd have to multiply it times a billion. So parts per million. This is going to tell me my parts per million. So 0 0.00015, which you see is like a really small amount of copper, divided by 500, and then times 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. What did you get? 0 0.3. Okay, do the math. Everybody gets 0 0.3. And I always do the division first and multiply it times a million. You could take 0 0.00015 times a million and divide it by 500. You get the same answer. It's fine. But I got 0 0.013. So is this toxic? What do you have to do to figure it out? Compare it to the standard that they give you. So notice the very top thing. Copper in drinking water is toxic above levels of 1.3 parts per million. So mine is only 0.3, so it is safe. Okay, so this, it is less than 1.3 parts per million, so it is safe to drink. Arsenic is toxic above levels of only 10 parts per billion. So parts per billion are really small amounts. If you detected 0 0.08 milligrams of arsenic in a 7.5 liter water sample, would this be toxic? Somebody's trying to kill you. Because <laughs> arsenic was always like used by like the crazy old ladies. That's how they always killed people. <laughs> Causes some crazy neurological problems. <laughs> so I want to know parts per billion. What's my solute mass? Mm -hmm. 0 0.08 milligrams. I've got to put it in grams, right? Because remember, this is the unit. I've got to put everything, I've got to put my solute in grams, put my volume in milliliters. So there's a single unit conversion there, times in a line. Milligrams goes on the bottom, grams goes on the top. Gra milli gets the, anytime you see milli, what goes in front? A thousand. Milli gets a thousand, grams gets the one. Point zero eight divided by a thousand. Really small amount, point zero 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 eight grams. Now I gotta do my volume. So volume is mm -hmm, seven point five liters. Is that in milliliters? No, so I know I've got to convert this one too. So this one's a double conversion. So I'm gonna to have to take seven and a half liters, convert it to milliliters. What unit goes on the bottom? Liters, mm -hmm. So liters will be on the bottom. Milliliters on top, because that's my answer. Milli gets a thousand, liters gets the one. So now this is 7.5 times 1,000, because 1,000 is in the nominator. So this would be whew, 7,500 milliliters. Yes? Decimal places goes to the right three places. So now I got my grams, and I've got my milliliters. So I've got to put them together. 
So 0 0.00008 grams divided by 7,500 milliliters. And then whatever that is, multiply it times a one with nine zeros after it. So that's a billion. Point one two three four eight divided by seven five zero zero times what'd you get? Mm -hmm. Yep. So I got ten point five 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 six. <laughs> parts per billion. So is this safe? Why? It's greater than 10. Arsenic is toxic above levels of 10 parts per billion. So you see that? So anything above 10, toxic. So 10.5, yes, toxic. Now the question comes in, well, what about significant figures? So I will tell you, in figuring out parts per million, parts per billion, if you're comparing it to a level, don't round, just compare it, okay? Because if I had to round this, how many significant figures in 0 .8, 0 0.08? One. How many in 7.5? So in theory, I'd have to round this to how many significant figures? One, which would be what? Instead of 10.555555, it would just be 10. Would you want somebody to round your number if they were testing your water? No. <laughs> so don't just automatically be like, oh, well, I just got to round it. Because in this one, it would round to 10. And so according to this, arsenic is toxic above levels of 10. But if I rounded it, it looks like it's at 10. Anything over 10 even though it's 0.5555 that gets rounded off, I would still call that toxic. I wouldn't want to drink it. <laughs> so don't round it if you're doing a comparison to a standard number. But if I asked you what is the parts per billion with scientific with significant figures, you would actually end up rounding this one to 10. What about the one above? So the one above 1.3 parts, well, we won't use this. 1.3 parts per million, that's like a standard or a reference number, right? So you would only use measured numbers when you do rounding. So 500 mils, that has how many significant figures? One. 150 micrograms, that has two. So my answer would only have one significant figure. Well, I'm okay there because 0 0.3 has just one significant figure. So I wouldn't have to do any rounding for that one. So if I ask you to calculate the parts per million or parts per billion, then make sure that you include significant figures in rounding. But if you have to compare a number to a standard, then look at your whole number. Don't look at your rounded number when you come up with an answer of whether it's toxic or not. All right, I'm going to let you do one more. You try this one. See if you can set it up. This is about fluoride. So fluoride is added to drinking water because it helps to make the enamel of your teeth more resistant to acid breakdown. So it's been associated with reducing cavities, especially in children. If they add too much fluoride to water, it can actually cause white spots to begin to develop on the teeth because it's almost like excessive amounts of fluoride collects in the enamel of the teeth. So this is why they try to regulate this. They want to make sure that the fluoride in drinking water doesn't have a concentration above four parts per million. So they do routinely test water that leaves the plant where fluoride is added. And so if they test your tap water and it has 0.62 milligrams of fluoride in 250 mils, is this water safe to drink?
So in this, let's see if I can unfreeze it. You do have to convert for the grams of the solute because we start off in milligrams. 0.62 converted to grams, dividing it by a thousand, I got 0 0.00062 grams. Milliliters, I'm good because it's 250 milliliters, so I didn't have to change that. So I can use it as it is. So I point, put 0 0.00062 grams divided by 250 times a million, and I got 2.48. So is this safe to drink? Yes. Anything below four parts per million would be fine. So you would say, yes, this is safe to drink. Now, if I was going to round this, if I asked you what is the parts per million, how many significant figures in 0.62? Two, 250. So that means that 2.48, I have to round to two, so it would be, I would keep the two in the four, so 2.4. Next number's an eight, so it's going to round up, so it'd be 2.5. So if I was going to keep to significant figures, I would end up rounding that one to 2.5. But I would... I would compare the, the actual number that I got in my calculator with all of those digits to that limit always, okay? So just do those steps. Just put your solute in grams, put your solution in milliliters, then multiply it times a million or a billion, okay? And that way, like, there's a couple of those, so you not a problem getting those. Last part of the math. What if you have a solution and you need to decrease the concentration. So what if you start off with a 20% solution and you want to decrease the concentration to 2% or to 5%. So you want to make a lower concentration. That is how you do a dilution. So the little picture they show you, I don't know if you've ever used these. There are some people that are like, I can't drink water unless it has flavor in it. Okay. There's some people that just cannot drink plain water. It's terrible tasting. That's just like, they can't tolerate it, whatever. So they add like these little Mio drops and there's different ones like flavorings. They come in these little tiny bottles. So you just use like one squirt per water bottle. And what it does is one, it adds color, which I don't really think is all that important, but it, it adds flavoring. Okay. So it'll add an orange flavoring or a fruit flavoring, some kind of flavoring to it. And so then you're drinking more water. So that's an improvement. It's not something sugared because most of the time these are really low sugar concentrates. So that squirt is a very concentrated solution of colors and flavors. We're going to add it to water to make it a less concentrated, more palatable. You wouldn't want to squirt that stuff straight in your mouth because that would be like very, very strong. Anybody ever made lemonade out from the drink mixes or Kool-Aid, you've made, you've done a dilution for a concentration. So you've done this before. It's really now that you're just able to do a calculation to determine if you have a starting initial concentration. And remember, this is always going to be more, the initial is always going to be more concentrated. And we are going to take some amount of that, and I'll call that C1. They call it C initial. I'm going to take some amount of that concentrated solution. So we'll call that amount V1, and I'm going to add water to it. And by adding water to it, I'm going to increase the volume. So V2 is always bigger than V1. The final volume is always going to increase because you're adding some amount of water. So this concentration is always more than V1. And then I'm going to, by adding water, I'm going to decrease the concentration. So C2 is always going to be less concentrated. So in this, just like with the gas laws, you always know three out of the four. And it's just a matter, really, of solving for the one you don't know and then plugging the numbers in. So kind of like approach it in the stepwise fashion like what we did with the gas laws. So this one. What was the original concentration of a glucose solution if you used 275 mils of it to make a 1.75 liter to 5.25% solution? So you've got to go through. See, there's three numbers. Anytime you see percent, percent is a concentration. If you see molar, molar is a concentration. So either of those is going to be your concentration. Volume, you know, is always going to be liters or milliliters. So looking at this, 
C1, V1, C2, and V2. So 275 milliliters, what is that? Is that V1 or V2? Want a little louder? V1. Mm -hmm. So 275 milliliters is my V1 because that's the original concentration. So that would be the volume of the original concentration. What is 1.75 liters? That is the second volume. So 1.75 liters, second volume. And then 5.25% C2. Mm -hmm. So 5.25%. And so my unknown is... What was the original concentration? That's my unknown. So before you go any further, just make sure you check the units. With volume, I'm going to have to make my volumes cancel when I do the multiplication or division. I have to make sure that the volume units are the same. So this one, they're not. Do you see that V1 is milliliters? V2 is liters. So in that, you're going to have to convert one or the other, and it really doesn't matter which one you do. The answer will be exactly the same, so you just pick one. Which one do you want to do, V1 or V2? V2, okay. So convert V2 into milliliters, or convert V1 into liters. It doesn't matter. Okay, they've got to be the same because when I do the math, my units have to cancel. So I've got to make sure that the units are the same. So this one is 1.75 liters times in a line, liters on the bottom, milliliters on the top. Remember, milli gets a thousand. Anytime you have milli, a thousand goes in front of the milli. Liters gets the one. So 1.75 times a thousand is now 1,750 mils. So now my two units are the same. So do make sure, I promise that I won't give you molar and percent solution because that would be a nightmare to convert. <laughs> if you get a dip, if, it's, if they're not gonna match, it's gonna be the volumes, okay? So make sure your volumes have the same units. If one is milliliters, the other's liters, you've gotta convert one of them and it doesn't matter which one you do. So now C1, V1 equals C2, V2. And I got to find C1, so what do I have to move? V1. So I've got to divide both sides by V1. If I divide both sides by V1, it's a 1. Then V1 and V1 will cancel on the left side, moves it over to the other side, so now C1 is all by itself. So all I do now is just plug in the numbers. Just make sure you double check and put the numbers in that match. Don't flip your volumes, which is like a common math error. So C2 is 5.25%. V2 is 1,750 milliliters. And I'm dividing it by V1, which is 275 milliliters. So do you see that I have milliliters on top and the bottom? So milliliters and milliliters can cancel. It's one of the reasons that I use my units when I do the math, just so that I make sure I have the right units to cancel. So 5.25 times 1,750 divided by 275. and I get my percent. It's 33.40909091%. That is C1. So you know you can't keep all that. So you gotta go back to your measured numbers. How many significant figures should my answer have? Three, everybody see that? All those numbers at top, 275, 175, 1.75 and 5.25, all three significant figures. So the first three significant figures are the three, the three, and the four. So the next is a zero, so all of those just drop off. So this, with significant figures, would be 33.4%. That is my initial concentration. 
So it's kind of like Boyle's law. It's kind of that, like the gas law, P1, V1 equals P2, V2. So it's really kind of the same sort of setup. Identify what each of your three knowns are. Identify what your unknown one is. Rearrange your formula. Plug the numbers into the formula. And then from there, make sure that you do the rounding. Okay? So not too bad. All right. So the last part, the last part of chapter eight. Oh, we're doing okay. The last part of chapter eight, we may be able to get through this today, is osmosis, diffusion, and transport. So talking about solutions, sort of like relating all of these solutions to the body. So you have electrolytes, you have salts, you have nutrients, you have waste molecules, there's gases that are dissolved in your body fluids. All these things are trying to get from point A to point B, right? So when you inhale, oxygen's in high concentration in your lungs and it diffuses, which is just movement from high concentration to low concentration, it diffuses into the blood. So your red blood cells pick it up, okay? So red blood cells contain the hemoglobin, which can actually bind and hold oxygen. That carries that oxygen through the blood. So when you have this arterial oxygenated blood, it's real bright red because of the oxygen that's in it, changes the color of the iron that's in the hemoglobin. Now, as it passes into tissues, there, your body cells have low concentration of oxygen, but the blood has high concentration of oxygen. So high concentration to low concentration allows oxygen to diffuse out of the blood and into cells. So that type of transport is really what we're talking about in this. So the first one they talk about is movement of solvent, which is called osmosis. Osmosis is defined as a movement of solvent molecules always from high concentration to low concentration. always high to low. High to low is a passive process because remember we talked about disorder <laughs> way back in chapter five. Disorder, things like to spread out, right? So when you start with all of the dishes put away, they don't like to stay there, right? So dishes end up like getting spread out everywhere and it requires a lot of work to put them back all into order, cleaning the house, putting everything back in its little spot. Things tend to spread out. Well, same thing. That is really what transport is, is molecules like to go from where they're at high concentration, all compacted together and spread out so they have more space. So that's what water does. And your body can do this and allows for movement because cell membranes are what they call semi-permeable. So semi means kind of, right? So you remember your cells. Cells have that phospholipid barrier. Right? So remember that you have those little polar heads towards the outside. They like to interact with water. Those nonpolar tails on the inside create that little hydrophobic barrier, almost like a little oily wall, stabilized by stuff like cholesterol. This keeps things that are hydrophilic from being to just able to pass through. But water is kind of unique because water has its own set of channels. Every cell membrane has water channels. And water channels, remember those channels, when we were looking at the phospholipids, there were those channels that kind of looked like this, right, that went all the way through and looked almost like they had a little tunnel passing through like a pore. So those, those integral proteins, I'll add a few more little heads and tails over on this side. Those integral proteins have the ability to transport molecules that wouldn't otherwise be able to pass through the membrane. So this is going to create this little passageway. And this is, this one, for example, is specific for water. So this doesn't let glucose through. This doesn't let salts through. It only allows water molecules to pass through because otherwise water would not be able to pass through the membrane because of that phospholipid barrier. So if we have a cell 
where the salt concentration inside and outside of the cell is the same. They call that an isotonic condition. The term iso means equal. The term tonic actually means solutes. So isotonic is when you have equal solute concentration in and out of the cell. So if we have equal salt in and out, then that means that we have equal water. So water doesn't have to go in and out because they're already balanced. So an example of that is what they call physiological saline. Physiological saline, the normal salt concentration that's found in the blood is 0.90% sodium chloride. So if your blood has 0.9% sodium chloride, which means 0.90 grams of sodium chloride, per 100 milliliters of solution, that is called physiological saline, and that is isotonic. So that's the same concentration in your cells, in the blood cells, as it is in the blood itself, and that is called an isotonic condition. So they call this physiological saline. It is the normal salt concentration that's present in the blood. If you're in an isotonic condition, water moves in or out kind of equally in and out of the cell. So there's no change in how those cells appear. They say that they're well hydrated, so the water content is equal. But what happens if a person drinks a lot of water? Okay, so we're not talking like you get your liter bottle out and drink half of it. We're talking like what if somebody drinks like a gallon of water in a sitting? Okay, that's a lot of water. Okay, when you think like your blood, your blood volume is somewhere in the range of about five liters. Okay, so five liters is like a, almost a gallon and a half. So what happens when you drink a gallon of water? That is going to then get absorbed and that is going to change the fluid content of the blood. So now, if we have all this influx of water, what is that going to do to the physiological saline condition outside of the cells? Is the concentration of the salt going to go up or down? Down, because we're diluting it, right? Just like doing the dilution. So if all this water comes in, now I'm like salt concentration is going to go down. So this is going to decrease my salt concentration. Compared to inside of the cell. So I'll have low salt outside, but that means that the salt concentration inside becomes higher comparatively. So I have low salt outside of the cell. The salt concentration inside is really isotonic, but compared to what's going on outside, it's actually higher than it should be. So if I have more salt inside compared to that diluted salt outside, salt can't pass through. Sodium chloride is charged. It can't pass through the cell membrane, but water can. Water can move because it has its channel, and the channel doesn't depend on anything. Water can freely move through the channel to try and balance the salt. So in comparison, if I have a low salt outside, that means I actually have more water. And inside, if I have more salt, I comparatively have less water. So what did osmosis say? Osmosis says that solvent molecules, if they can move, will go from high to low. So which way will water go? Into the cell or out of the cell? It's going to go in, right? It's going to go from high to low. So water starts to flow into the cells. So these cells, and that's like supposed to be a little red blood cell, like a little donutty kind of shape. So that cell, as water flows in, what happens to the cell? What will happen to its shape? It's going to begin to expand, okay? So that cell will actually begin to swell. 
worst case scenario, it can actually pop like a balloon. Okay, there is a maximum expansion that can occur. So if you think about this in lab, this is the same as the piece of potato that we cut and put in distilled water, right? Because we said in distilled water, there's no salt in the, in the liquid outside of the potato. So it had a very high water concentration. Inside of the potato, the water concentration was less. We let it sit for about 45 minutes. Do you remember what the potato felt like? That potato, after sitting, the mass went up. And how did it feel? It was real firm. It wasn't bendy. It was really hard because water went in and caused it to swell. And that, the mass actually went up. So that was that third potato, the one that just sat directly in the distilled water. That condition of having this low salt higher water concentration outside of a cell is a term they call hypotonic. So the term hypo means low. Tonic is solute. So if you have a lower than normal solute condition, this can cause cells to change shape, cause water to move into them. Now I will tell you that like this has happened in the past. There was, there was a, a game, like this was on a radio show. They had like, it was when the Nintendo Wii, do you remember the game, the Nintendo Wii? Like when it first came out, there was a radio show that was like, oh, we're gonna have a Wii for a Wii game. So the, the game was, so they had two contestants that came in and they had to drink as much water as possible. The one that peed the last won the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so two people came in. A nurse called in and said, you know, this isn't safe to do. And they were like, it's just water. It's fine. So they like completely ignored her. Two people came in. They started off, they drank 500 milliliters of water. Both of them. Okay, Can, do you have to pee? No, no. Okay, so now you're going to drink another cup of water. So every five minutes, they had to drink a cup of water. They sat there and drank and drank. So the woman that won ended up drinking over a gallon and a half of water before she had to go pee. She won the game, she went home, she had a headache, she laid down, she actually ended up with cerebral edema and she died. Yes. Uh huh. And that family sued the radio station, all the disc jockeys all got fired, the manager got fired, like it was like this big huge thing. Mm -hmm. Because that's extreme. So it is not something that you're gonna routinely like have come into like this person just drank all this water if they're doing that then there's other underlying issues okay but this can happen if you have a patient that's dehydrated because if they're dehydrated now they already have a low water volume so their cells are somewhat dehydrated when they come in if they start to ingest a large amount like you start running lots of fluid into them too fast this can cause the cells to shift that can create a hypotonic condition. So when you give them IVs, you don't just give them water, you give them a saline IV. So you've got solutes in it. So that as the cells begin to recover from being dehydrated, they don't recover too quickly. You replace the volume without actually changing the tonicity, without changing the actual salt concentration. Okay, that's the more common time. And if you think like after you've been sick, so you've been like, had the flu, vomiting, diarrhea, the whole nine yards, so you're kind of dehydrated. When you start back drinking water and keeping it down, what did your mother always tell you to do? Did she give it to you and be like, here, drink all of this right now? No, she always told you to just take sips, right? Take sips, wait a while, takes more. One, I would do that because if you vomit, that's less to clean up. But two, it's also because of that, because if you're dehydrated, you want to kind of rehydrate in stages, not large amounts of water all at one time. You want to do a small amount of water weight, small amount of water weight to let those cells hydrate slower so that you don't end up with big cellular volume changes. So what happens with the opposite? If a person was gonna go and drink some seawater, <laughs> don't drink seawater, <laughs> okay? It's fine if you get a little bit in your mouth. Like we had a dog we took to the ocean was like drinking the water. I was like, what is wrong with you? And then he was like, bleh. <laughs> he couldn't keep it all down, right? So natural, natural reflex that actually happens in animals. But if something happened and somebody drank seawater, then that means they're ingesting a lot of salt. 
Okay, so if you're ingesting a lot of salt, come on. So if you ingest a lot of salt, what happens to the salt condition outside of your cells? The salt goes up, right? So we're gonna increase the salt concentration, which means comparatively, if there's more salt, there's less water. Higher salt con conditions lowers our water. Compared to inside of the cell, which is isotonic. Inside of the cell now actually has less salt compared to outside and has more water compared to outside because in, outside now has all this salt, less water inside comparatively has more water. So salt can't move, but water can to try and balance the salt. So which way will water move? Mm -hmm. So water's gonna go from where it's at high concentration to low concentration and what happens to the shape of the cell? If water comes out, water comes out, water comes out, the cell begins to shrink. Mm -hmm. So the cells will actually get kind of like all shrunken and raisiny looking because of that loss of water. That's a hypertonic condition. We did this with beakers one and two with the potato. So you made like a 1.3% solution, which still was a little hypertonic. And then that 15%, the 15% was the big one. Okay, because that's way higher than what is solutes inside of the potato. That caused water to come out. And how did that potato feel? It was real soft. It was real soft and bendy, almost like a noodle. So you could like squeeze it. It was like mushy feeling. Because of that loss of water, the mass went down, all because that high salt condition sucked the water out. It's really like how you make a pickle. As you put it in a vinegar brine solution, water gets pulled out of the cucumber, Cucumber shrinks, you make a pickle, okay? It's that water change because of different salt conditions. So hyper, hypo means low, hyper means high. Mm -hmm. So this, a hypertonic is a high solute condition. It could be high salt, it could be high vinegar, it could be high sugar, anything with that has that higher than normal, higher than isotonic is a hypertonic condition. This is what happens with dehydration. Okay, so with dehydration, you begin to lose blood volume. So then you begin to pull fluid out of other tissues. One of the tissues you pull fluid from is the area under the skin. So like if you take your skin and you like pull it up, it should bounce right back, okay? So they, that's just normal because of the amount of fluid that's present in the skin. So it's sort of like it bounces right back, that's good. If you have a patient that's dehydrated, you will actually be able to pull this up and it does what? It stays, yes, they call it tenting. <laughs> have you seen that in animals? Like I've had little, I've like had lots of little rescue puppies over time and they would come in and they'd be all like, <laughs> you like lift their skin up and it stays like this and slowly drops back down. You're like, ooh, you need some water. <laughs> this little guy is dehydrated, okay? Just because of conditions of where they've been. During dehydration, you can lose, if you lose blood volume, you don't want blood pressure to drop because blood pressure is what keeps your blood moving. So if you lose blood volume, you pull fluid out of tissues. And so all those cells then begin to start shriv shriveling up or shrinking. They start losing that volume. They end up getting that kind of wrinkly look to them. That's called crenation, okay? That's just the shriveling that actually happens. So there's a good picture here. This is actually electron microscope pictures of red blood cells under these various conditions. So see how the normal red blood cell, a normal red blood cell, it's called a biconcave disc. To me, it looks almost like a donut, but it doesn't actually have the hole in the middle. It's just thinner on the center than it is on the outside. So in this isotonic, physiological saline, normal amount of salt and water inside and out, the shape stays the same. Second one, if we put it in a low salt condition, lots of water outside, water starts to move in and you see how that cell swells, how it gets big and round, it loses that little flat shape. Third one is looking at the hypertonic condition. So notice how as water comes out, that cell begins to shrink, kind of like look like a funny old deflated balloon as it loses that volume. 
just their pictures versus my pictures. Okay? So just remember, like, water is going to try and move to keep this balance. And water has those little channels. So there is always a water channel in your phospholipid membranes that allows water to move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. The goal is to try and get concentrations equal, to try and get the solute concentration. If salt is high over here, water moves towards it to try and dilute it. And if it dilutes it, then everything stays. This is just goes into stuff, some of the stuff we talked about. The other one is... The other kind of transport is called diffusion. So osmosis is talking all about solvent. Diffusion is talking about solute. But it's the same kind of movement. It's the movement here of solute particles from high concentration to low concentration. So notice that this, just like osmosis, is trying to spread itself out. It's trying to do that disorder thing. It's trying to have this natural process of trying to spread itself out. Their example here is if you put a drop of green food coloring in water. So notice that the water is completely clear initially, but then you put that drink, green food coloring in, it'll then like drop in, you'll see it start swirling and swirling, you leave it alone, eventually the entire thing will look uniform. It will look just entirely green because the water, the solute has the freedom to move through that solution and completely spread itself out. Like if you pour cream in your coffee and you don't stir it, you go off and do something, you come back, it's all mixed on its own, right? So it'll just mix itself. Liquids with liquids are pretty good about doing that. Solid, sometimes you have to stir them like sugar. It'll still be sweeter on the bottom. That's just because the solids drop to the bottom. They're a little slower to diffuse, but something that's a liquid is going to diffuse a lot easier. So in the cell, we have this happen as well. So these are all called passive transport. Passive needs no energy. So no energy is required. Always molecules move from high to low. So given the opportunity, molecules always want to try and spread out. They want to try and make equal amounts of particles on both sides of a membrane or a layer or a barrier. Small molecules, water moves by osmosis, and water has channels even though it's polar. The only other molecules that really can freely move in and out are gases. Gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide, because they are gases, the phospholipid is really not a barrier to them. They can pass through because being a gas molecule. They pass from high concentration to low concentration. So they call that what they call simple diffusion. It's simple because it doesn't require anything and it's really what this first image shows. Here's oxygen molecules. So like I said, oxygen is carried in the red blood cell in the blood. As it passes by tissues, oxygen's at high concentration in the blood, but body cells have low concentrations of oxygen. So high to low, oxygen diffuses from the blood, out of the blood, and into the tissues, and then straight in through the phospholipid barrier into the cell so that they can be used to generate energy. So oxygen is really important to be able to generate that energy. Carbon dioxide is going to go the exact opposite direction. So carbon dioxide is made in the cell. So that means CO2, 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 CO2 being made inside of the cell. So it builds up. It's <coughs> now at high concentration inside of the cell and it can diffuse but it's going to diffuse out. So carbon dioxide is going to freely move out 
So you've got this swapping. Gases act independently. They're really just moving because of passive transport. High concentration to low concentration is the goal. All right? All right, so I'll quit there. I've got to finish like facilitated active transport and then dialysis. So this is the last topics in chapter eight. So over the weekend, if you've got a, I think you have a dynamic study module that's due, you can be working on chapter seven, chapter eight, the post lecture homeworks, get those ones done because you don't need them to like study. If you didn't grab a concentration worksheet, I've got the like little half sheets that are up here to kind of practice worksheets and the key is posted in Moodle. 